Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, last year over one million refugees fled to Europe. Half of them were Syrian refugees. But to put this in perspective, still 4.5 million refugees are hosted in the region, Jordan, Turkey, or Lebanon. And around 7.5 million are displaced inside Syria, inside the country. And one thing is pretty clear. Modern emergencies are different from the past. Only one example. So the average time of displacement for refugees is around 17 years. That blurs the line between emergency answers and responses, stabilizing responses, and of course, long-term development opportunities. And that means the global community has to react more innovative, creative. We need new responses to the refugee crisis. And therefore, we have during the entire annual meeting many sessions around the humanitarian imperative. And so we invite you to take part of the humanitarian imperative program. And in order to inaugurate the many sessions over the incoming week, we have now this high-level panel. And allow me to introduce you, if it's not always necessary. First and foremost, Your Majesty Queen Rania of Jordan. The Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium, Minister of Development, by the way, number five donor country in Europe. Deputy Prime Minister of Turkey, Peter Maurer for the International Committee of the Red Cross, and the business voice, Hamdi Ulukaya from the company <coughs> Chobani. So warm welcome to all of your excellencies. <clears throat> your Majesty, what can the global community and the private sector do in order to support host countries like your country, like Jordan? Well, I think when trying to understand the refugee situation, we need to keep three things in mind. First, around the world, there are around 60 million uh, refugees. That's probably the highest number since World War II. And 85% of those refugees are hosted by developing nations. And the third thing is that most of those refugees are in a protracted uh, refugee status, sometimes lasting for decades. As you mentioned, the average is 17 years. So uh, the crisis doesn't end when a victim crosses the border. It actually morphs into a state of suspended existence for refugees and then expands to include overwhelmed societies. Yet most of the responses that are uh, employed when dealing with refugees are very short term and almost entirely dependent on humanitarian aid. And the longer the problem persists, the less of a priority it becomes. So, for example, 60% of the refugees in the world are trapped in situations that are far away from the international spotlight, which means that at the end of the day, it's left for the host communities and the relief agencies to shoulder the burden of trying to cater to forgotten populations in, uh, uh, in host communities. So, um, what ends up happening is sometimes when solutions are designed for the short term, they end up causing long-time distress. And this is the situation that we're facing in Jordan, where, as you may know, we have 1.3 million Syrian refugees. That is 20% of our population. And 90% of those refugees live in our towns and cities. They're not in refugee camps, which has put an immense amount of pressure on our um, economy, on our social and physical infrastructure. So you'll see that our schools have become overcrowded, our healthcare centers, etc. And although we're very appreciative of some of the support that we're getting, the needs really outpace and outweigh the support. So for example, last year, foreign aid accounted for only 30%, 36% of the cost of hosting refugees. We've had to borrow to cover the rest. And so we're not talking anymore about a, an emergency uh, or an exclusively humanitarian crisis contained in refugees, but an economic reality that spreads all over Jordan. And so we really need to come up with a new narrative that transcends the um, a humanitarian development divide that talks about growth and investment, not just relief and aid. We need to have new interventions 
and we need to have new partners like the private sector. I think at the end of the day, what a refugee wants more than anything else is a sense of independence and reliance. And you can only get that from a job. But for a country like Jordan, trying to solve the refugee crisis with our citizens' jobs, which are already in short supply, is not feasible. You can't solve one crisis by creating another. So what we need is to create new jobs in the countries that already host uh, large numbers of refugees. We do that by first having significant investments in job generating projects and also by providing incentives and guarantees for foreign firms to come and set up shop and, and relocate some of their production chains in uh, those countries and also to try to give new, uh, access to new markets. So, for example, trade concessions from donor countries or creating um, you know, refugee product as a brand that gets preferential access in, in, in countries. So, speaking for Jordan, we are willing, if we get the critical mass of investment, and if we get significant support from the international community, we are willing to set up uh, special economic zones that will employ uh, these uh, refugees. Now, when you do that, not only are you giving the refugee the sense of economic self-sufficiency, which will lower the cost of hosting refugees, but you also give him skills and training that he will put to good use once he returns to his country. So in a sense, you're incubating a post-war Syrian economy across the border in Jordan that will kickstart the recovery uh, process in Syria once the conflict ends. And that is really critical. And the alternative is actually quite frightening. The alternative is for these refugees to continue living in poor living conditions, to languish in, in dependency, uh, to make, become vulnerable to recruitment. So what we're talking about is a real paradigm shift from short-term crisis relief thinking to more holistic, sustainable approaches at, uh, and a new blueprint for dealing with, with refugee issues. So thank you, Your Majesty. Peter Maurer, as a representative of an international organization, the ICRC, so how can the international organizations adopt to this new complexity, to these modern emergencies? Well, let me just say first and foremost, uh, I'm often asked whether this is the worst crisis uh, we have seen, and I'm always cautious to compare crises in 152 years, we have seen world war and genocides and uh, things unfolding in front of us, so I'm not in the comparative business. But what strikes me, and uh, you mentioned it, Philip, at the beginning, this is qualitatively a different crisis. And uh, Queen Rania just mentioned it's a shift from short term to long term. It's also a shift from a systemic crisis, for, from an individual crisis where individuals are affected first and foremost to a systemic crisis. Water systems fall apart, social systems fall apart, educational systems fall apart, and this asks for another response than the traditional humanitarian response. It's also an urban crisis compared to a rural crisis. More of the fighting today and the victims are urban victims, and urban settings are more fragile, more vulnerable. So my point here, my first point is, indeed, I would fully endorse the fact that this is qualitatively a different crisis and needs a paradigm shift in dealing with this crisis. So how does a humanitarian organization does it? I think uh, there are all the traditional approaches which we know, and I don't want uh, in a short time to repeat them, but we have as an organization a continuous ambition to be faster and more effective, and we have that ha had that ambition over the last 150 years. But today, I think, there is really a point in developing new tools and new relationships with the private sector. It won't solve all the problems, but it will represent an important sea change. What uh, we have done, by the way, with uh, Alexander here on the podium with me as well, is also to design a new product, a financial product in the form of a humanitarian impact bond. We will launch it uh, uh, tomorrow here in Davos, where we hope to find social investors and outcome funders, and to deliver 
clear outcomes within a certain period of five years uh, that we have defined in creating disability centers worldwide. It's just an example of bringing the private sector and the outcome funders, most likely the public sector, together with the new financial tools. We are working because Klaus Schwab uh, has set the stage with the fourth industrial revolution. We are launching together with a couple of other agencies a global humanitarian lab, uh, trying to build on new technologies and see in how far new technologies can help us to be more effective and more efficient and to, to have a better return on the money that we have. We are exploring distant and 3D printing. Uh, we are exploring new communication tools in, in terms of assessment of the realities. So we, we are designing new products which hopefully uh, are felt to be attractive uh, for the private sector. And then of course uh, this all should help us to bridge the gap between the enormous needs that we are witnessing today and which are reflected in staggering numbers of refugees and displaced persons, uh, people displaced within their countries and beyond, which are uh, reflected in uh, the destruction of all the infrastructure, and the staggering gap between those needs on the one side and the relatively modest uh, expression and response of the international community. It is indeed unacceptable what the situation that we have seen in Syrian besieged cities in the last couple of weeks and which have come to the forefront. But let me just say, these are just three places, Madaya, uh, Kefraya, Fua, are just examples. There are many of them and we need to really be inventive, innovative in order to step up the response and it, an important part will be a new qualitative relationship uh, with the private sector, although this will not be everything. So, thank you, Peter. Hamdi Ulukaya. So, we learned from Kin Ranier as well as from Peter Maurer, there are some new responses to these modern type of emergencies. They are not asking for money, not for charity, but for an entrepreneurial approach. So, from your point of view as a business voice here on the stage, so what would your new response to the modern emergencies? Look, we, we are, Her Majesty said it, Peter said it, we are facing the, one of the biggest humanitarian crises in, you know, since World War II, and if it's not greater. And we are dealing with it with the conditions of 1940s and 50s. Um, the agencies or the way that we are dealing with it, it's very old. I got involved with this, you know, a few years ago, simply on a business side, but I got more involved um, a year and a half ago when a Yazidi community got attacked and it was all over the news. Um, I, don't, I don't forget that picture of the woman just putting her uh, hands up and asking for help. And you can see it because if you are from the region, she is asking for help. And we acted right away and I got involved more. And my first action was to get to understand what is actually happening. You know, what's happening, who's helping, who's out there, and what's the solution? I saw amazing people working in the field, heroes from UNHCR or other organizations. They are there in a bad conditions, but they don't complain, they just want to help. But they also asking help to do this differently because they are there and they see it all the time. I went to Lesbos, I, you know, uh, to the island when the refugees that come from, from the Turkey side. It was unbelievable. If an entrepreneur like me or somebody who has a business mind was in that island, it's a winter time, you know, rooms are empty, restaurants are empty, there are a lot of people, taxis are not busy. Why there is no place for people to stay and why there is no people to transfer it in a humane way? And you could just put things together right there, it wouldn't cost you too much and it would be very, very easy. So what I'm trying to say is we need to come to this in a very, very innovative way simple way, and the third thing is we need to get it from the business side, where governments and the NGOs are doing what they are doing, we need to bring the business perspective in. And that's what I started TENT, and the biggest thing that I come to Davos for is the TENT challenge, where we ask others to join us, the ones that already have been doing it, and I am really, really um, encouraged with the response. So we got, 
you know, LinkedIn, who's already doing work amazingly, connecting workforce with the uh, need. And we have, you know, Airbnb, who's providing housing in the places for the, uh, uh, you know, aid workers. You got, you know, my friend uh, Hikmet's company CEO is the, uh, you know, Western Union, who's up front came out. You know, you got Mastercard, you got. IKEA, for example, is working for the UNHCR for the longest time, creating a better shelter for, uh, for the refugees. And I think by, by the next couple of days, we'll have more and more, and I have more in companies. This is very encouraging. What I, what I am hoping that we find you know, the business perspective into this biggest humanitarian you know, crisis, and we bring the governments and NGOs and the business units together break the barriers, sit around the table, or meet around the uh, field, and make it work. The other part is the business can do is, I know it from my experience, I started hiring refugees five years ago. I went to the refugee center in Utica, and later on in Idaho, and I said, I'd like to hire them. They said, there's no transportation. I said, let's, let's provide transportation. They said they have different, different languages. Actually, we hired people that they speak 11 different languages. 30% of the Chobani's workforce today is 30, uh, refugees, right? In New York City, in, in upstate New York, and in Idaho. Here's what happened. Because we hired refugees, they got job. When they got job, that is the moment they stop being a refugee, they are part of the society. And what they do is they help to build the society. I have a picture of a mother who I have in my phone as uh, one of the, my best, uh, favorite pictures. Her daughter went to Yale. She said, I just don't know if this was the best thing to happen to me. Can you believe that she said that? Because her daughter went to Yale, and she has a Chobani sign on her, and then daughter has the Yale and says, which one looks better? This is how we're going to build lives because there is so much sadness. And, and I finish it with this um, anecdote where Nadia, who is a Yazidi girl, who got captured by a terrorist and horrible stuff happened to her, and, and you know what that is. She's a teenager and she made her way out and then finally made it to Germany and then she came to the US and I met her in the restaurant, we were having lunch. She's the only one I met. I saw on the news what happened to that community, but I never met them. I, had, I met her. All our shortcomings, the political shortcomings, economic shortcomings, whatever that is, that disagreements, all the cause of those, she paid the price. And she's looking at the world in her empty eyes. And she smiled tw twice in two hours when I asked how was the mountains, Sinjar Mountains, behind her village. And she smiled, she said, our mountains were so beautiful. We used to go up there and pick flowers. She, she, she remembered there. And the second one, I said, you know, we are helping the refugee camps in, in northern Iraq and Kurdistan to bring blankets. And she smiled again. The only way we're going to make them to recover, the only way that we're going to make them at least not forget, but at least move on, is if we give our hands. And that hand is so important today, where we cannot avoid in the refugee crisis and the refugees, which we cannot close eyes, forget about it. All we have to do is just do something about it, whether we like it or not. And I love how the business community approach to this. And I'd like to think more businesses from the, from, the, from the region where you know, Turkey and Jordan and Lebanon, not only the countries, but also the people of these countries are doing their part above and beyond uh, their capability. We'd like to see more businesses from Gulf regions to step up. And if the governments don't step up, we need the business people and, and entrepreneurs to step up because you know, in years, we're not going to remember who built the tallest building or who brought snow into the desert. We're going to remember who reached out to those people. We remember who has the biggest heart 
and who give them the coolness to their heart. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Hamdi, for this encouraging, I think, new response of the modern emergencies. Alexander de Croo, as the Deputy Prime Minister of what we mentioned, donor country. So you've heard now so many new responses of these kind of crises and emergencies. Would this change maybe your strategy as a donor country? Yes, it does. And, and I think that if you look at the, the refugee crisis in, in Europe, you have a, a head of state of a fairly large European country who famously said, das schaffen wir. And I think we need the same speech in the Syrian region. I think that at some point we need to say, this is difficult, it's never going to be perfect, but we need to tackle it in a different, uh, in a different way. What is happening today, I think, is this is, is the worst that you can do to a human being is to take away his or her's perspective in life. This is what is happening today. If you are five, six winters in the refugee camp, people lose perspective in life. And someone who's lost perspective in life, that leads to desperate actions. And that's what we are, uh, we are seeing, uh, seeing today. I think we need to acknowledge, just in the same way like we acknowledged after the Second World War in Western Europe, that this is a region with special needs, and we have special needs, you need other instruments than the classic instruments that we have uh, seen today. I think there's two elements we need, to, uh, we need to focus on. First one, it was said, the average duration of, of a refugee life, if I can call it that way, is today 17 years, sometimes 20 years. So this is very, very long. So we need to tear down some walls. In, in the development world, there is a big wall between humanitarian action and development. Humanitarian action, short term, is helping out, is, is a pressing need. Development is creating perspective in life. I think in, in what we are doing today, we need to break down that wall. And, and Peter, I'm, I'm not saying that the ICRC should become a development agency. Don't be afraid. I think humanitarian organizations are doing a great job. But you need to combine both. And we need to, from the start, work on what I said, giving people perspective in life. And that means giving them access to the, uh, to the labor market, what is happening today in, uh, in Turkey, giving them access to, to education, and acknowledging that probably at least part of their life, they're going to build it up in the region where they are. We all would hope that the Syrian uh, conflict is solved soon, and we all hope that it's rebuilt on the short term, but if we're realistic, I think we know that it's actually going to take a few, uh, a few years, uh, unfortunately. Second element is um, access to financing. If you look at what the combination of the member states and the European Commission is doing today, it's approximately uh, 4.2 billion. Um, it's an enormous amount of money, but it's not enough. And I think governments and, and public authorities if we are fair, we know that we will not be able to mobilize the means that we actually, uh, we actually need. And I think that mobilizing the private sector is something that we can do, and we can do it in a, in a very modern way. Peter talked about uh, what the ICRC and, and Belgium and hopefully some other countries is going to do together on humanitarian, uh, humanitarian impact bonds, where we basically ask the private sector to pre-finance interventions based on certain metrics, and if those metrics are achieved, then you get a payout to the private investors with a certain, uh, uh, with a certain premium. I think this is the way to do it, and, and if we look at the Western world, you cannot say that there's no money. I mean, there is capital. The capital is there, and very often the capital is, is sleeping in, in savings accounts to frustration of a, of a lot of people. So I think those new instruments can really unleash things. And it's a, it, it's a balance. I think we should mobilize uh, private financing, but obviously in exchange for that, the humanitarian organizations and the NGOs need to provide quality and need to look much more into what are we providing, how much impact are we providing, and is this really an impact in a, in a sustainable way? Um, and I think this is the way, this is the way forward. I am, uh, despite 
all the, the, the problems and the misery we, we see. I have visited uh, some of the camps on the, on the Turkish-Syrian uh, border. People are still very hopeful. And people, uh, people know that it's a difficult situation. And you see that some people are, are losing perspective, but it's not lost. I mean, not everyone has lost perspective uh, yet. And we can give people perspective. I think if we start tearing down some walls in our own functioning, and we mobilize new ways of functioning, and new ways of, uh, of financing, I think it is perfectly feasible to give everyone in that region a perspective in life. And I think we, uh, we owe it to humanity to do that. Thank you, Alexander de Croo. And particular thank you that you, again, put the entire discussion into the right perspective. It means the European discussion into the relevance of the situation in the Levante. And that leads me then to the Deputy Prime Minister of Turkey. Deputy Prime Minister Simsek, so Turkey is doing, as Jordan, Lebanon, such a lot for the refugees. And you mentioned it even two years ago, here even at the annual meeting. So now what is, from this point of view, your perspective and your response of the modern emergencies? Well, thank you. Um, what we are faced is really a global issue. I mean, you know, 60 million people flee their home simply because of violence or terror or whatever reason. This is huge by any standards. So this is a global problem. It requires global solutions. I think along with Jordan and Lebanon, Turkey is bearing quite a bit of burden. Um, I'm actually proud of my country because we are currently hosting 2.5 million Syrians in Turkey, about 278,000 of them in camps, the rest in around the country. Uh, and we've just provided them with work permits so now they can get jobs. Uh, we're providing them with education. There are about 700,000 Syrian kids of school age. And I think it's so important to provide them with education. Otherwise, if they're left illiterate, they're more vulnerable to other influences, including terror and violence. So clearly, there is a lot that you know, we're doing, and, and there's a lot that globally can be done. Uh, we do provide them with, with health care and all other public services. But I think we need to go to root cause. And the root cause is, if we speak of Syria, now Syria is, after Second World War II, is the largest, basically, humanitarian crisis to the extent that I know, because there are over 12 million displaced people, four and a half million refugees in neighboring countries. I think we should come to some sort of understanding, the global community, UN has to be more active, that urban areas should not be bombed because when you terrorize urban areas, then you get mass exodus. And I think that's really critical. That is something that is still missing. And sadly, the regime still has the air power. And, and, and you know, we see on a day-to-day -day basis a refugee uh, movement has not stopped. So that's really one thing. We need to go to the root cause while our immediate priority is to save lives, is to provide them with safe havens. And that's why my country has open door policy without any form of discrimination. We have Syrian Arabs, Kurds, we have uh, Turkmen's, we have people of different, you know, not only ethnic but also religious backgrounds. Uh, so it is very important to, to maintain the open door policy to provide them with, with safety. But I think the longer term solution should be found. So the challenges we have is three folds. Is to manage existing stock of refugees. And you know, this is a huge task. Uh, and I think that's where the world needs to share the burden. Uh, so far, Turkey has spent $8 billion just on refugees in the camp, which is Roughly, as I said, about 278,000 versus about 1.2 million outside of camps. Uh, I think that same applies to other neighboring countries. So clearly, 
what private sector like Chobani is doing is very impressive. There's a lot that stakeholders can do, international organizations, private sector, um, you know, NGOs, civil society. But I think countries also, I mean governments, can do a lot. And we, we're very grateful to European Union now that they've recognized that there is a problem. I think for many years they sat on the fence thinking that it was a problem in distant sort of land. And now that some of those refugees showed up at their doors, it's, it's welcome that they now are now sensitive. I think international community should do more and can do more. So we need to address long-term implications of this. Uh, so one thing is to manage the existing. The second one, as I said, for us to prevent the new refugees. And that requires stopping barrel bombing in Syria by regime, but also you know, by other regime allies who are now bombing urban areas. The third one is resettlement. So the job is not done by simply giving them refuge and, and giving them education. I think in the long run, when there is a peaceful settlement in Syria, hopefully it will happen at some point, then the world again needs to work together to help these refugees resettle. Now we, re we recognize many of them probably won't go back. But still, for those who want to go back, I mean, the cities, uh, Aleppo is about 110 kilometers away from my constituency. I'm a member of parliament from Gaziantep. And Gaziantep is only 110 kilometers away from Aleppo. Aleppo is such a great historic city. I was there in 2010. Amazing, like Jerusalem. Amazing, literally. And now it's been all destroyed. So even if people want to go back, I think we have a task at hand we need to help. And again, international community should get together and, and you know, help for the resettlement. So the problem is a huge one. And sadly, when we look at past few years, these type of refugee problems are now more complex, more protracted. And as I said, it is a global issue and it requires global solutions. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister Simsek. Ladies and gentlemen, so this panel is uh, neither a classical penny, nor can we come to a conclusion as of now. So the purpose of this panel is first to, what I mentioned, to inaugurate our humanitarian imperative program during this annual meeting. And second, it's in order to encourage all of us to accept the global responsibility to really address in a new way the modern emergencies. So thank you very much to the entire panel for your encouraging statements and thank you very much to put all the different discussions into the right perspective. Big hand to our today's panel. Please, to the plenary, do remain seated. So, ladies and gentlemen, on the topic of improving humanity, we know the important role of religious leader. So many religious leaders are joining us for this annual meeting. On Friday, for example, allow me to highlight this, we will have an interfaith discussion with the Grand Mufti of Egypt, Ayatollah Iravani from Iran, as well as the Archbishop of Canterbury. So we will really offer the platform for interfaith dialogue and understanding. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to call on stage His Eminence, Cardinal Turkson, President of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, who will convey a message on behalf of his Holy Father, Pope Francis. Excellency, the floor is yours.
So this is addressed to Professor Schwab. So to Professor Klaus Schwab, Executive President of the World Economic Forum, before all else, I would like to thank you for your gracious invitation to address the annual gathering of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Klosters, at the end of January on the theme, Mastering the Fourth Industrial Revolution. I offer you my cordial good wishes for the fruitfulness of this meeting, which seeks to encourage continuing social and environmental responsibility through a constructive dialogue on the part of government, business, and civil leaders, as well as the distinguished representatives of the political, financial, and cultural sectors. The dawn of the so-called Fourth Industrial Revolution has been accompanied by a growing sense of the inevitability of drastic reduction in the number of jobs. The latest studies conducted by the International Labour Organization indicate that unemployment presently affects hundreds of millions of people. The financialization and the technologization of national and global economies have produced far-reaching changes in the field of labor. Diminished opportunities for useful and dignified employment combined with a reduction in social security are causing disturbing rise in inequality and poverty in different countries. Clearly, there is a need to recreate new models of doing business, which while promoting the development of advanced technologies, are also capable of using them to create dignified work for all, to uphold and to consolidate social rights, and to protect the environment. Man must guide technological development without letting himself be dominated by it. And so to all of you, I appeal once more, do not forget the poor. This is the primary challenge before you as leaders in the business world. Those who have the means to enjoy a decent life, rather than being concerned with privileges, must seek to help those poorer than themselves to attain dignified living conditions, particularly through the development of their human, cultural, economic, and social potential. We must never allow the culture of prosperity to deaden our senses, to make us incapable of feeling compassion at the outcry of the poor weeping for other people's pain and sensing the need to help them as though all this were someone else's responsibility and not our own. Weeping for other people's pain does not only mean sharing in their suffering, but also and above all realizing that our own actions are a cause of injustice and inequality. And so let us open our eyes then and see the misery of the world, the wounds of our brothers and sisters who are denied their dignity and recognize that we are compelled to heed their cry for help. And so may we reach out to them and support them so that they can feel the warmth of our presence, our friendship, and our fraternity. May their cry become our own, and together may we break down the barriers of indifference that too often reign supreme and mask our hypocrisy and egoism. And so once we realize this, we become more fully human, since responsibility for our brothers and sisters is an essential part of our own common humanity. So my brothers and sisters, do not be afraid to open your minds and hearts to the poor. In this way, 
you will give free reign to your economic and technological talents and discover the happiness of a full life which consumerism of itself cannot provide. As I have often said, and now willingly reiterate, business is a noble vocation, directed to producing wealth and improving our world, especially if it sees the creation of jobs as an essential part of the services to render for common good. As such, it has a responsibility to help overcome the complex crisis of society and the environment and to fight poverty. This will make it possible to improve the precious living conditions of millions of people and bridge the social gap which gives rise to numerous injustices and erodes fundamental values of society, including equality, justice, and solidarity. In this way, through the preferred means of dialogue, the World Economic Forum can become a platform for the defense and protection of creation and for the achievement of a progress which is healthier, more human, more social, and more integral. We do regard also for environmental goals and the need to maximize efforts to er eradicate poverty as set forth in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and in the Paris Agreement under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And so, Mr. Pro President, Professor Schwab, with renewed good wishes for the success of the forthcoming of the ongoing meeting in Davos, I invoke upon you and upon all taking part in the forum, together with your families, God's abundant blessing. From the Vatican, 30th of December, signed by Pope Francis. Thank you. <laughs>